major trauma and advanced trauma life support so how do we handle the patient we we who are suffering from major trauma like road traffic accident or a, or motor vehicle injury or if the patient fall from a, a height a tall building and fracture multiple bone so how we deal with that situation let's talk about it now see here major trauma is a serious life threatening injury multiple bone may be fractured here multiple internal organ may be injured the same patient may be having head injury the same patient may be having pneumothorax or hemothorax the same patient may be having spleen or liver rupture the same patient may be having pelvic bone fracture see there so this type of patient is very serious hypovolemia or hemorrhagic shock can occur and lots of other complication can happen so it is life threatening most patient with multiple injury have major orthopedic injury which in isolation or are in combination are life threatening definitely now the management of major trauma differs from center to center every center have its own protocol and when we are working at that particular center we need to follow that protocol remember this and if the if your consultant or if another doctor or any person from another center have come to you and ask why are you managing like this you can show the protocol this is the protocol which we follow here in our center but it should be up to date it should be according to the rules and regulations okay and according to the new standard the key to successful management of major trauma patient is to have an effective early system for resuscitating and assessing the patient coupled with a service allowing rapid and efficient transfer to a large trauma center offering wide expertise now let me explain this by giving you okay uh, some good example for example you are working in a remote area you know very small district hospital for example you have very limited resources there not very uh, you know expert people a uh, a big bus or the public bus okay uh, uh, had an accident and lot of people were brought to your hospital at a time there were 20 people who are who are having multiple fracture okay multiple trauma in the body all of them were brought at the same time now it is a big problem for you because you are not having any you know uh, proper resources or manpower there so what you do during that situation okay this is a critical time so if i can manage by doing advanced trauma life support to those people who i can resuscitate and revive i will do that in my hospital otherwise i will quickly arrange the transfer of them to a large trauma center okay i will not waste time there this is the meaning arrangements for pre hospital care vary in different country definitely it vary in different country as well as in different center as well in the accident and emergency department which is present in every hospital these days okay another term for this is emergency department or we can call it trauma center in the accident and emergency department the trend is towards highly trained teams of surgeon anesthetist and nursing staff so you should have good manpower there if some uh, this type of disaster come okay then we should be able to handle so good team of orthopedic surgeon good team of anesthetist and nursing staff should be there all the time the advanced trauma life support or atls in the short form very commonly used term of the training was developed in 1976 in the usa by an orthopedic surgeon 
who lost members of his family when his light aircraft which he was piloting himself was crashed in nebraska is a state in usa so that was the incident which happened to that orthopedic surgeon who lost the family member during the aircraft you know crash and after that he developed this advanced trauma life support okay principles so that other patient will benefit from it so we are going to talk about the same atls now now share it is now the atls that have spread worldwide that orthopedic surgeon devised it for the first time but it is spread worldwide and used in all over the world these days now what is it all about see here in this atls system the patient is managed by a team okay. there is a team here it it cannot be done by only one person it is managed by a team with each member carrying out is or her own task and with an experienced team leader providing overall supervision so now let me compare this with resuscitation okay resuscitation in resuscitation of the patient in a medical side okay for example uh, advanced cardiac resuscitation for example okay so we also do similarly there is one leader the leader will give command to each of the member and each of the member will follow that and do their thing so this is a coordinated thing it should not be haphazard it should be well coordinated this is atls the leader is responsible for pre planning the activity of each team member so he has to assign what each team member has to do during that time so this is the job of the leader and now what are the process they will do during atls now see there the first is primary survey and resuscitation primary survey and resuscitation followed by secondary survey of the patient and then review documentation and initial treatment plan so this this whole uh, process is called advanced trauma life support so let me repeat again primary survey of the patient along with that resuscitation after that secondary survey and then review of the case again documentation you have to document everything whatever you have done whatever you have given to the patient and then make a initial treatment plan and move accordingly now see there okay, this is a very very important you know discussion so i want you pay attention okay primary survey and resuscitation see there the primary survey is a sequence of steps from a to e and here the team member is only able to move from one step to the next when the preceding one had been completed means we have to follow the order you cannot jump you cannot move haphazardly here see this steps from a to e okay and the team member is only able to move from one step to the next when preceding one had been completed only after a is completed then i can move on to the b only when c is completed i can move on to the d like that i cannot start with e and go back towards the a this is the wrong way now these steps are a is for airway see this a is for airway and one of the important point there is cervical spine control or management also has to be done together so a airway with cervical spine control so so many times i have explained this principle for you and every student is quite familiar to this now and see here the adequacy of the airway is checked while respecting the potential for there being a cervical spine injury by maintaining the cervical spine immobilization now what is the meaning of this whenever this this type of severely injured patient is brought to you you always suspect they have also injured cervical spine there 
and if cervical spine is injured or fractured there is high chance of quadriplegia we discussed this before as well as there is damage to the phrenic nerve and phrenic nerve damage can result in diaphragm paralysis and patient can die in no time so cervical spine has to be immobilized now let me ask you one question how do you immobilize the cervical spine yes how do you do that cervical tracture yes cervical traction right you mean traction okay one is cervical traction any other any other way you know a bend like structure around the neck okay spongy leg that is called collar okay so let me write that for you maybe it is a bit uh, you know difficult for you at this time see here the cervical spine can be immobilized importantly by two way one is traction okay traction and another is color the cervical spine color they are these are of two type hard color and soft color hard color and soft color during this time of uh, you know real type of uh, cervical spine fracture or injury we apply hard type of color so that there will be no movement possible but if there are some soft tissue injury only the bones are not fractured in the cervical spine a soft color is also fine so after airway uh, with the cervical spine control now let me ask you uh, this thing though it is uh, discussed so many times how to manage the airway what are the different way of managing airway yes patient turn to the lateral position semi prone to left lateral position good what is semi prone or lateral position good excellent any other way et tube et tube very good endotracheal tube or et tube intubation is another one yes the third one tilt the chin sorry tilt the chin upward that's clear very good airway. very good clear the airway and tilt the chin upward very good so so many points are coming here okay so all of you please uh, uh, pay attention let me explain this in a good order here when the patient is in coma because of severe type of head injury we are talking about major trauma here head injury is one of the important component okay so patient may be in coma so during that time put the patient under semi prone or lateral position the first thing if there is something in the oral cavity remove it and if tongue has fallen backward okay pull that tongue forward if we put the patient in semi semi prone or you know lateral position the tongue will automatically fall on the sideways okay so there will be no chance of obstruction so these are very very important point now another is head tilt chin lift and jaw thrust maneuver so see there head tilt okay let me write this for you head tilt chin lift and jaw thrust this is another way of opening the airway but there is one very important problem in this condition if you believe cervical spine is fractured you will never do head tilt head tilt is contraindicated if cervical spine is injured chin lift is okay and jaw thrust would be fine what does that mean you don't move the neck and the head if cervical spine is suspected to be fractured now another one is endotracheal tube et tube definitely et tube or endotracheal tube intubation so these are the different way so if we keep on revising like that okay uh, we'll remember it for a long time let's move further another uh, you know step after airway management and cervical spine control is breathing the patient needs to be adequately ventilating via the patent airway by the patent airway the patient needs to be adequately ventilating via the patent airway this is important one after we manage the airway 
Now check for the breathing. Now how do you check the breathing now? How do you make sure the breathing is normal or effective? Yes? By counting respiratory rate. By well, little chest movement. Elevation of the chest or feel the air movement by the hand. The chest. Excellent. So everybody is answering in a very, very appropriate way. So you, I've already got the answer here. You look at the movement of the chest. If the movement of the chest is there on both sides, patient is breathing fine. You can even count the respiratory rate. Perfect answer. Okay. And if you have got a stethoscope at that time, you can simply listen for the breath sound on both sides. Equal breath sound should be present on the both sides. If on one side there is no breath sound, now remember which type of case we are talking now? Multiple trauma. So, what you suspect on one side of the chest if there is no breath sound? What do you suspect? Collapse of the lung or thorax. Thorax. Side of the Excellent. Only two conditions I can think here. There are so many other conditions can happen, okay? But at this time, only two important conditions should come in your mind. One is pneumothorax, another is hemothorax. Pneumo hemothorax, which is very, very common in case of trauma case. Now let's move further. Okay. Now, C stands for circulation. So after we have done A and B, now it's the time for circulation. So in the beginning, you need to make sure, okay, take the blood pressure, palpate for the pulse, examine for capillary refill time, everything which tells you what is the state of circulation. And if there is active blood loss from somewhere, this is the time will stop that blood loss. Now, how to stop blood loss? If you can see bleeding, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, for example, patient is bleeding outside. How do you stop that blood loss? Apply the pressure. And apply the pressure. Compress and... Or bandages. Very good. Excellent. You apply firm pressure there. Okay? With a clean type of towel or cloth. You keep on applying pressure there for a few minutes and most of the time bleeding will stop. Sometimes you can apply some tourniquet as well. That is a, a you know other way but remember if you forget about the tourniquet and kept on applying it for a long time the, the distal part of the limb may get ischemic. So that is the danger. Now another way if it is a severe type of arterial blood loss then quick transfer of the patient to the hospital is very much necessary because sometimes a surgery has to be done to control the blood loss. And if the internal blood loss is there, I cannot do anything from outside. We have to open that area and fix it, like liver and spleen rupture or rupture of aneurysm. Okay? We cannot give compression from outside during that time. So these are the different ways. D is for disability. So what do you mean by this? You quickly examine for disability in the patient. Now disability, in this case, we are talking about neurological disability. For example, after major trauma, some of the important nerve trunk may be uh, you know, uh, damaged. Okay, Some of the important nerve trunk may be damaged uh, so that uh, some disability may be there okay, in the patient. And E is for exposure. E is for exposure. The whole patient must be exposed so that any occult injury can be dealt with. Means remove all the cloth, whatever is there on the body of the patient, and then fully examine the patient. This is called exposure. So it is A, B, C, D, and E. A, B, and C, every student know this. Uh, we routinely follow that in medical patient also, but D and E are part of advanced trauma life support. D stands for disability examination and E is exposure. Let's move on.
now having a uh, non these uh, different steps okay what that team is doing in primary survey and resuscitation how how would they you know uh, coordinate the thing so let's talk a little bit about it because this is a practical information for us who knows we'll be in the same situation okay sometimes later resuscitation occurs whilst the survey is being carried out so that at the end of the primary survey the patient should have a stable airway and circulation and be adequately oxygenated this is our our goal this is the objective of this atls patient should have a stable airway patient should be breathing fine and the circulation would be maintained let's see here in the multiply injured patient or in case of multiple trauma patient there are often procedures required as the primary survey is being carried out and each team member has a separate role so the team leader cannot do all the thing the the work load has to be divided between the team member now let me explain this situation for you this patient has pneumothorax so when the when one member is assessing the patient or evaluating the patient he has found out there is a pneumothorax now that pneumothorax most probably this is a case of tension pneumothorax in this type of situation has to be evacuated quickly now this is the job of the another member this is what i mean here so the member one is responsible for looking after the head end of the patient and secure the airway control and stabilizes the cervical spine by applying the hard collar which is very commonly done and assesses and assists the breathing and oxygenation so this much work load is enough for one member so see here what that member has to do secure the airway or manage the airway controls and stabilizes the cervical spine most importantly it is done by hard color application and then assessing and assisting the breathing if the patient is not breathing probably ambu bagging has to be done at that time if pneumothorax is there put one needle in the second intercostal space in mid clavicular line allow that okay air which is uh, under pressure to escape outside and give good amount of oxygen now what is the role of second member there member 2 is responsible for circulation and should secure at least two good iv line assess for the presence of shock if it is there or not and start or commence fluid resuscitation take blood for cross matching obtain blood gases and ensure external hemorrhage has been controlled very very important job of that second member so let's elaborate uh, you know on this two good iv line so probably in the last class also i talked about this uh, where we keep iv line in this type of patient where exactly in the body which, which is that site yes on the hand okay in the hand where exactly in the hand is it in the dorsal surface of the hand or in the cubital fossa dorsal side of the hands rest near the rest okay. now listen here this is a bit of practical knowledge for you if we put cannula in the dorsal surface of the hand we can easily keep there okay i'm not saying this but if you have to give a large amount of iv fluid it is not possible from there because those veins are the very small caliber vein but if you put the vein into median cubital vein which is present in antecubital fossa these are large caliber vein in comparison to the vein of the dorsal surface of the hand so if possible you need to cannulate on both antecubital fossa and the name of the vein is median cubital vein that has to be done very quickly and it is the job of the second member 
who is involved in that ATLS process. Assess for the shock. Now every student know what are the signs and symptoms of hypovolemic shock. So how I know this patient is in shock or not? I want some quick answer here. Yes? How I know the person is in shock I, or not? I put by white and signs. Hypotension. Vital signs. Skin. Sun can eye. Dry skin. Okay. Laziness. Good. Capillary time. Rapid breathing. Low, low, low blood pressure. Excellent. So, so all of you, please pay attention here once again, so that you can make a concept out of it. This this type of shock is hemorrhagic shock. It's a type of hypovolemic shock. But it is not occurred here as a result of loss of fluid from the body. It has occurred because of loss of blood directly. Okay, we are talking about trauma. Remember this. So, this shock can be diagnosed by palpating the pulses. The central pulse would be feeble. They would be feeble and they would be fast. So, this is called fast and thready pulse. The volume of the pulse would be low. Number one thing. Number two, if I feel the uh, you know peripheral part like hands and feet, they will be cold. They will be cold and clammy. Clammy means okay, they're sweaty. Excessive sweating is occurring there because of uh, sympathetic nervous system stimulation. Number three, capillary refill time will be prolonged than two seconds. Very very important point. And number four, okay, number four, the person looks pale. The overall appearance of that person is very pale. If, if the person has lost a lot of blood, the person looks pale. Apart from this, if you have blood pressure instrument, if, we, if we are at, at the hospital, definitely during ATLS, we do this in the hospital to measure the blood pressure. It may be normal in the beginning or it may be low when the shock is already in decompensated stage. Monitor for urine output, okay? This, this has to be done. So all these are very, very important point. If shock is present, you start the fluid and the fluid is again crystalloid, crystalloid. So which are the types of crystalloid? Which are those? Normal saline, Normal saline and ring lactate. Very good. Normal saline and ringer lactate or lactated ringer. Normal saline and lactated ringer. These are the uh, fluid and you give this fluid in a good amount. Up to three boluses can be given very safely. If you give large uh, amount of fluid, ringer lactate is preferred over normal saline. Take blood for cross matching. Who knows this patient needs blood because this is a hemorrhagic shock. Probably crystalloid alone may not be enough. So do blood grouping in your own hospital and do cross matching also. Prepare the donor and this patient most probably needs blood. It is your job. You need to foresee those things. And during the emergency situation, you know, you cannot run here and there for the blood. Obtain ABG. This is a very serious case, probably in shock. So there may be metabolic acidosis because of arterial, uh, sorry, because of all these hypovolemic shock. So this is easily diagnosed by arterial blood gas analysis and uh, external hemorrhage should be controlled. So all these are important. So we're talking about uh, advanced trauma life support and uh, inside that primary survey and resuscitation. Uh, there are different uh, member one person cannot do all the necessary things. So probably there are three or four members or even more than that in the team. Okay. And there will be one leader. That leader will give responsibility in, for each of the team member. Now, what is the uh, function or job of member three? It is responsible for carrying out any urgent surgical procedures like cricothyrotomy or cricothyroidotomy, chest drainage, intravenous cut down, etc., which are necessary in that patient. Now, just analyze this term, crico 
thyrodotomy what do you mean by this anybody sir we cut between the trichoid cartilage okay okay so i'll come to you anybody else open it right area mm -hmm. okay now see that crico thyrodotomy means there is a membrane which is in between thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage both of these are cartilage of our larynx thyroid and cricoid there is a membrane in between them in case of critical airway obstruction above the larynx which is very common to happen in a multiple trauma case we open the alternative airway by cutting this cricothyroid membrane which is called cricothyroidotomy okay so let me repeat again in case of multiple trauma patient where there is obstruction of the airway above the larynx in this situation we need to create the alternate airway passage and that is done by making an opening in the cricothyroid membrane that is known as cricothyroidotomy chest drainage is very very important in case of pneumothorax and hemothorax which is quite common in trauma case and the intravenous cut down means secure the iv line okay if if the uh, member 2 uh, could not do it properly through the desired site so we need to cut the vein in the lower limb maybe the long saphenous vein has to be cut down so all these things are done by the member 3 and if there is some ongoing bleeding the person needs to control them now look at this picture here this is a team okay who are uh, you know they are uh, working together in a very coordinated way in a management of multiple trauma case now see there now after doing the primary survey and resuscitation what is this what is secondary survey now let's talk about it now this secondary survey is a complete and systematic examination of the patient from head to toe and from front to back we need to examine the patient completely otherwise something would be missed because in primary survey it is only some life threatening problem which would be tackled okay and secondary survey should be done to find out something else apart from them so it has to be done and it is usually done by the team leader the patient being log rolled as necessary patient should be log rolled as necessary this is a important point and to log roll the patient one person cannot do this okay there should be multiple persons who are necessary there for example somebody uh, two or three person should uh, catch the patient and in a very coordinated way patient should be rolled on the side so that the fracture would not be aggravated at this stage the level of consciousness is assessed according to the glasgow coma scale and we are going to talk about glasgow coma scale uh, you know um, in this class at the same time x ray of the cervical spine x ray of the chest and x ray of the pelvis are performed very routinely because they are absolutely important site in case of multiple trauma if cervical spine is fractured we need to identify that early and manage accordingly chest the rib fracture are very common and that rib fracture can give to pneumothorax or hemothorax and pelvic fracture can give rise to massive blood loss inside the pelvic cavity which is associated with hemorrhagic shock and we need to manage that as well see there so this is about a secondary survey now let's talk about this glasgow coma scale first then i will come back to this review documentation and initial treatment plan let's talk about a uh, glasgow coma scale now because it is uh, very much related with our topic in a multi trauma patient or case 
the chances of head injury is very high and what is the level of unconsciousness that is okay a non by doing glasgow coma scale so glasgow coma scale has uh, three important you know categories or responses eye opening response verbal response and a motor response we call it e v m in a short form uh, either way you can uh, mention it okay there is no problem so uh, under the eye opening response there are four points if eyes open spontaneously it is a score of 4 if eyes open to verbal command speech or shout it is a score of 3 we ask the patient can you open your eyes and if the patient is doing that 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 means that is score of 3 eyes opening to pain only score of 2 the pain should not be applied on the face okay in somewhere else in the body it is score of 2 and no eye opening is a score of 1 So this is regarding the eye opening response let's go to the verbal one oriented well to time place and person is five the orientation is always judged according to the time place and person time what is what time of the day or night every every normal person should should be able to answer that place where where exactly the person is right now hospital or home and third one the person should identify the close relatives like wife husband daughter son okay they should identify doctor nurses like that so this means a score of 5 confused conversation but able to answer the question is four point confusion inappropriate response okay words are discernible as a score of 3 is inappropriate response you are asking one question and the answer is coming in a different way which has no relation incomprehensible sounds of speech two points i cannot identify what the person is saying but there is a production of sound and no verbal response has a score of 1 regarding the motor response obeying command for movement is score of 6 okay that's a maximum score of 6 if i uh, say can you raise your hand uh, upward the person is doing that and that is a obeying command purposeful movement to painful stimuli has a score of 5 purposeful movement to painful stimulus has a score of 5 means the person is you know taking that part verbally away okay withdrawing from the pain score of 4 abnormal flexion or decorticate posture as a score of 3 decorticate posture means the upper limb are acutely flexed but lower limb are you know extended and extensor a rigid response or decerebrate posture has a score of 2 it is uh, the meaning is all four limbs are extended the whole body is in the extension position so it has got poor prognosis than decorticate posture and finally if there are no motor response it has got a score of 1 so if you add all these scores together the maximum score we will get is see here 4 plus 5 would be 9 and 9 plus 6 would be 15 so 15 is the maximum score and minimum score is add 1 1 and 1 so minimum score is 3 so 3 and 15 in case of minor brain injury the points is 13 to 15 points in case of moderate brain injury it may drop till 12 and in severe brain injury it is drop less than 8 and i have already told you many times regarding this glasgow coma scale less than 8 means the person is in coma usually okay the person is in coma so this is now another uh, important part of atls is reviewing documentation and formulating the initial treatment plan so let's talk about that now the team leader is also responsible for the final review documentation and initial treatment plan in atls this is done by the team leader see there initial treatment plan the further treatment plan documentation and final review everything has to be done this involves checking all resuscitation procedures have been carried out or not he has already given responsibility to other team member and he will check whether those things have been done or not very important point 
sometimes the patient cannot be stabilized in the emergency department or in the accident okay department so the patient needs to be taken quickly inside the operation theater and we have to do some emergency procedure for the control of hemorrhage or sometimes the patient needs to be taken for urgent investigation like ct scan of the abdomen i can give different example here please listen carefully in case of spleen rupture spleen as well as liver rupture now how do you confirm the diagnosis how do you confirm the diagnosis this is done by quick ct scanning we can suspect it there is no doubt about it because the patient is in hemorrhagic shock we can always suspect that it has happened but the real confirmation we need to do ct scanning there so it will confirm so that has to be done quite quickly but let me repeat once again if the patient is not stable do not leave the patient alone in the radiology department patient may collapse there patient may die there so if even if it is necessary we have to be there all the time along with the patient so that if some resuscitation is necessary we can do it there a plan is prepared for the further management of the patient and transfer is arranged as necessary if i cannot do further management in my hospital under my leadership i need to transfer the patient somewhere else somewhere else means in the better center of course that has to be done and make sure you do detailed documentation you see this the detailed documentation has to be done if you are sending the patient somewhere else the doctor of that hospital needs to know which type of patient is this what have you done there so everything has to be well documented and uh, before the patient leaves okay it has to be completed and given to the patient party or if somebody is accompanying the patient to the other hospital it has to be given on the hand of that particular doctor or nurse so that he will hand over the patient to the another center and they'll take care of the patient so this is very very essential okay so let's move on now so let's summarize whatever we have discussed in atls okay this will uh, give you another very good concept what is the etiology or the cause of the trauma make sure by taking a good history quickly if the patient is unconscious or in coma take the history from the person who accompanied the patient there is it high energy trauma like motor vehicle collision or road traffic accident or fall from a height or not and whether it is associated with spinal injury or life threatening visceral injury or not that can be known by physical examination as well regarding the clinical presentation examine for local swelling tenderness deformity of the limb and instability of the pelvis or spine this will help us in the diagnosis whether there is a fracture or some serious other injury examine for the level of consciousness by glasgow coma scale just now we talked about this examine whether the patient is in hypotension or hypovolemia or not every student know what are the features of hypotension or hypovolemia now this is a very critical point and consider the involvement of alcohol or other substance use many of the time the person has you know a suffered from accident because of the alcohol abuse or other substance abuse so make sure whether they are the case or not if they are the case you have to inform police even in case of major trauma or accident or something like that you need to inform the police if some foul play is suspected you have to inform the police okay but don't delay your management don't say let the police come first and i'll manage nothing like that we never do like this save the life of the patient make the patient stable police will come on their own time investigations are 
trauma survey, which we have already done. It's a part of our ATLS. And at the same time, take the X-ray or CT scan wherever it is necessary. The important areas are cervical spine, okay, chest X-ray, pelvis X-ray, and all the bones which you suspect are fractured, you take the X-ray. And let's not forget the rule of twos in X-ray. You take the lateral view and the AP view, okay, the joint above and below the fracture site, and always the normal site is also taken to compare. So these are the important points in investigation. Now, finally, the treatment. So see that this is a summarized way. A, B, C, D, and E. This is the part of our advanced trauma life support. We have done that. And we have done the resuscitation for life-threatening injury as well. Assess the genitourinary injury by examining the rectal examination and vaginal examination in case of female. Now, you don't need to do much there. Just, uh, you know, do a per rectal examination or digital examination of the rectum. If the tone of the rectal sphincter or anal sphincter, I should say, is intact, probably there is no damage to the nerve. So this is one of the very good way of judging. If the anal sphincter tone is well maintained, probably there is no neuronal damage. And similarly, vaginal examination has to be done either by okay, a digital examination or a speculum examination. Make sure it is not injured. External or internal fixation of all fractures are essential part of the management, which we have already dealt with. And make sure DVT prophylaxis is given. If there is a serious type of injury, uh, this patient uh, will need long time bed rest, okay, or rest in the hospital. So DVT prophylaxis is very much necessary. So which drug you give for DVT prophylaxis? Which drug? Anticoagulants. Like? Give me the... Heparin or heparin. Heparin. Exactly. exactly. To start with, it's heparin. And to maintain, we give warfarin. Heparin first and then warfarin later on. Very good. Now, make sure the complications are there or not. And that is known by a detailed examination of the patient. Already talked about hemorrhage, so let's not go into the detail again. Make sure there is no fat embolism syndrome. And these are the different points. We have already done that before. Shortness of breath, hypoxemia, petechial rash in the body, decreased platelet count, and some of the neurological symptoms because brain is another organ which is very commonly damaged after lung in fat embolism syndrome. Make sure there is no venous thrombosis. Deep vein thrombosis is very common, just now we talked about, and deep, vein, uh, deep venous thrombosis can give rise to pulmonary embolism also. Make sure there is no bladder, urethral, or bowel injury by proper examination. When you are doing that D component of uh, ATLS, okay, if there are some neurological damage that can be diagnosed, this is called disability okay, examination. Make sure there is no persistent pain, stiffness or weakness in the affected extremity and sepsis. Okay? Make sure it is not there. And this is very common in open type of fracture. High chance of infection there in open fracture. And sometimes what happens, we have missed some small wound there. And from that small wound, some bacteria may have entered inside. So make sure we have not missed any open wound there. Okay, otherwise it will cause a big problem later on. Now let's move further. So all of you, please pay attention on this slide there. See here. These are the common orthopedic emergency which we encounter in trauma center. This is the common mnemonic okay bone chop so it uh, it is a quite uh, easy to understand here v stands for vascular compromise 
we are mainly concerned about arterial damage here can you give me one example which artery can be damaged very commonly in case of fracture yes which artery popliteal artery popliteal artery in yeah. lower limb from supraplateal limb popliteal artery in lower limb popliteal artery break very good i already got the answer excellent popliteal artery in the lower limb and brachial artery brachial. in the upper limb very good these are the two commonest artery which are damaged popliteal artery in the lower limb and brachial artery in the upper limb the respective fractures fracture lower end of the femur fracture upper end of the tibia they are related to the popliteal uh, you know artery injury and then uh, in the upper limb the brachial artery is by supracondylar fracture of the humerus another important orthopedic emergency is open fracture or compound fracture always a orthopedic emergency always now why you may ask this question to yourself in the middle of the night if there are no surgeon in the hospital and the emergency personnel has informed you doctor one case of open fracture has just come in our hospital you should run towards that emergency department you don't say can you please give antibiotics can you please dress the wound i will observe or i will examine tomorrow morning that is not allowed because this open fracture is one of the orthopedic emergency it has to be dealt right then neurological compromise or cauda equina syndrome any any type of neurological compromise like damage to the spinal cord damage to other peripheral nerve like radial nerve ulnar nerve median nerve sciatic nerve okay common peroneal nerve tibial nerve these are so important that's why i gave you one important you know homework that every student should know the nerve root and pathway and the muscles which are supplied by those nerves okay so please uh, do that whatever you know homework is given do that sincerely do not copy blindly from other student okay that is not good compartments okay one one question what is cauda equina where where is it what do you mean by that spinal cord l1 l2 at the end of the sacral sensory motor loss of the blade and activity of the lower limbs and lower limbs very good so cauda blade also rectum good good i already got the answer excellent cauda equina okay cauda at the end of the spinal cord is present at the end of the spinal cord now what does that mean the spinal cord ends at the level of l1 vertebra so after that when the spinal cord ends a lot of nerve fiber they will present as cauda equina there okay cauda equina is like a horse tail appearance equina means horse cauda is tail so if you remember like they will not forget the appearance is like a horse tail a lot of the spinal nerves are present there and they will slowly uh, you know gradually or in order go out of the a uh, vertebral column to other parts of the body if they are damaged we call it cauda equina syndrome and you are right the rectum or the anal canal and uh, surrounding area would be non functional or will suffer because of this compartment syndrome no need of an explanation this occurs mainly in the upper as well as lower limb especially where there is there are presence of the two bones like radius and ulna in the forearm and tibia and fibula in the leg there are different compartments present because of interosseous membrane if fracture occurs or if some ischemia occurs in the site then there is a huge rise in pressure that leads to compartment syndrome this is a very important orthopedic emergency because it will lead to ischemia of the limb which is distal to that and what is the treatment of compartment syndrome i want one quick answer here what should we do in see 
जॉइंट both shoulder as well as hip dislocations are important orthopedic emergency especially hip dislocation because this hip dislocation is associated with decreased blood flow to the hip joint it can lead to ischemia of the hip joint and then a vascular necrosis of head of the femur that is a you know a very important complication so hip dislocation has to be treated quickly and treatment is very easy to answer you just say we need to put that joint back into the anatomical position okay this is the treatment we'll talk about that in detail later on in the respective topic osteomyelitis and septic arthritis are other orthopedic emergency we need to uh, uh, manage them appropriately after a proper diagnosis but one point i like to add here in case of uh, open or compound fracture there is a high chance of this infection so prophylaxis is very very necessary unstable pelvic fracture is another orthopedic emergency definitely there is a high chance of hemorrhagic shock there so it needs to be managed appropriately now we have reached towards the end of this topic no just like i mentioned before the management of open or compound fracture is repeated again because it is one of the very important orthopedic emergency so let's quickly go through this i've already done this before but it is such a important one so that it is nice to revise again open fracture or compound fracture means the fractured bone and fracture hematoma are in communication with the external environment through the open wound we can see the fracture from outside the fracture hematoma may be leaking outside this is called compound or open fracture this is a emergency situation so emergency treatment has to be given like removal of obvious foreign material if any there irrigate with normal saline if grossly contaminated definitely there is high chance of contamination in road traffic accident so thoroughly irrigate it wash it cover wound with sterile dressing immediate iv antibiotics are given broad spectrum iv antibiotics give tetanus toxoid or immunoglobulin as needed the important point is as needed if the person has already completed five pours of tetanus toxoid probably he or she doesn't need any more if the wound is very bad looking okay then probably tetanus uh, immunoglobulin has also should be given or is it necessary reduce and splint the fracture splintage can be done to relieve the pain or to prevent the further damage and reduction has to be done in the hospital there are different way of reducing the fracture which we already talked before keep the patient npo nil per oral nothing should be given from mouth and why is that why we keep the patient npo because there is high to aspiration aspiration pneumonia pneumonia will occur sir now listen here the answer is quite near okay npo has to be uh, kept who knows this patient needs surgery this patient needs to be taken in the operation theater and if general anesthesia should be given to the patient okay again the same point comes stomach should be empty otherwise there is high chance of aspiration pneumonia so the safe option should be do not give anything from the mouth we start iv fluid that will take care of okay npo very very necessary and prepare for or operation room send blood 
in the lab take the consent this is called informed consent explain everything to the patient and then take the signature do ecg if it is necessary and take chest x ray also if the patient is relatively older or if there are some heart disease or lung disease absolutely necessary in the operation room irrigate the wound thoroughly and do debridement debridement means removal of dead and devitalized tissue remove it that should be done within 6 to 8 hour to decrease the risk of infection if possible much earlier than that after you debride leave the wound open okay put a drain if possible and re examine with repeat incision and drainage in 48 hour if something is collected there so these are some of the very important point in the management of open fracture now this is the last slide uh, for today's class and we have already covered this if you remember uh, before also this is known as gustillo classification of open fracture if you cannot remember the name it doesn't matter this is the way open fractures are classified now see here grade 1 2 and 3 this is the you know length of the open wound less than 1 cm 1 to 10 cm or more than 10 cm and these are the description of the wound and these are the prophylactic antibiotic regime which we give here so let quickly go through it first generation cephalosporin for 3 days okay is enough if the person is allergy allergic to that then use fluoroquine alone if you believe MRSA strain of the staph aureus then use vancomycin every student have that knowledge now in grade 2 okay use cefazolin which is a first generation for 3 days along with that use one amino glycoside for another 3 days and in grade 3 which is a very serious one okay you have to add clostridial coverage so penicillin is added there along with other drugs so this is how we manage a compound or open fracture and this is considered one of the very very important orthopedic emergency